recording is on. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another night of Northshire Live. Thank you all so very much for being with us this evening. For those of you who don't know me, I am Rachel Person. I am the event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Saratoga Springs, New York. Um, thrilled to be here with you tonight. Before we get started, a couple of quick notes for everyone. Um, first of all, you may see that we are recording this event for future broadcast on our YouTube channel. However, fear not, we have the settings arranged so that it only records those of us who are unmuted and speaking. So you can have your camera on if you want and you will not be picked up for posterity um, and you will not show up on the YouTube channel. Um, in regards to that, please do use the chat throughout the evening. Um, and if you have any questions at all, we will be doing an audience Q&A at the end of the night. You can type questions into the chat at any point and I will happily ask them for you at the end of the evening. Um, and then last of all, before I introduce our special guest tonight, a word of thanks to all of you. Um, it has been a long, hard, strange year in the annals of small businesses in general and independent book selling in particular. Um, we're still here, our doors are still open. Um, we can do events like this one and that is truly thanks to the incredible effort and support of our customers, um, like all of you. So thank you so much for your ongoing. Um, now, I am so pleased and lucky to be able to welcome young adult author Jennifer Dugan to, to Northshire Live tonight. Um, I was lucky enough to meet Jen shortly before the publication of her traditionally published debut, Hot Girl, back in 2019. And it has been such a joy to watch her career really explode since then, um, with the subsequent publication of her novels, Verona Comics, and now Some Girls Who published just yesterday. Jen writes so respectfully for and about queer teens, and I am so grateful that today's teenagers can read her words and that I can too. Um, tonight, Jen will be interviewed by fellow author Dahlia Adler. Dahlia's most recent book, Cool for the Summer, just came out last week and was selected for the May-June Indie Next list, which is a very big deal in my part of the world. Um, she also edited the recent anthology, That Way Madness Lies, in which 15 YA authors reimagined and she's the blogger behind the absolutely indispensable LGBTQ Reads blog, which I have turned to more than once when stumped by customer questions in our kids and teens. Please join me in welcoming them both to North Star Live. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Especially me, I'm such a guest. I'm like, <laughs> this is not my neck of the woods. I have never been. This is very exciting to me. Yeah, you're <laughs> way upstate now. Yeah. This is, we call upstate like 30 minutes north of the city. So <laughs> now I'm learning what it really is, sort of You're from like my Westchester. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, house. Um, okay, so for anybody who might uh, still somehow, despite being here, need to be convinced to pick up a copy of Some Girls Do, can you give us your little elevator pitch? So Some Girls Do uh, follows Morgan, who is an out and proud track star, and Ruby, who is a closeted uh, by beauty queen, as they try to navigate uh, kind of falling in love and how that's going to work and pressures of their small town life. Um, so yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> So beauty queens and car obsession yes. and track star. So I would love to know not just your inspiration for the book, but the inspiration for those smaller details. You always have these smaller details in your books that are awesome and that require you to like really learn about stuff, whether it's, you know, summer jobness or comics <laughs> or so I would love to know where those details come from for you in general, but especially for some girls too. Um, well, for some girls do, I love running. So I knew I wanted her to be a runner. I knew I wanted Morgan to be a runner. Although I like to run like deep in the woods. And then I, since I set this, the time of year I set this in, I actually had to do a track season, which I didn't know a lot about. Um, so I'm like, okay, what do we do like in high school track? Because I just like run in the woods with a bunch of like deer and snakes and stuff. Um, and then for Morgan, I really wanted, or sorry, for Ruby, I really wanted two kind of opposite things. So I was like, okay, 
we have the beauty queen, which is like stereotypical, like feminine. And then, you know, cars are considered like often wrongly just for dudes. So I really wanted her to kind of embrace both sides. And something in the book that was important to me was even though, you know, the pageantry stuff is really coming from, from like pressure from her parents. Um, it's not that she, she's not a, like a, not like other girls girl. Like she still loves the makeup. She embraces that side of herself. Um, it's just specifically the pageantry, like the pageants and competitions. Um, so I really just wanted these two girls that are really like just super well-rounded, you know, girl figures to look at that are doing it all. Oh, I love that. That's really cool. Um, and speaking of doing it all and having them complement each other, um, a bit of a craft question for you, because now you've done dual POV, which is where you tell a story from um, two different perspectives, um, now more than once. So I don't think people realize what a challenge that is as an author to really differentiate those voices. And I think it's especially challenging if you write characters who are of the same gender and, you know, they have in common certain things like being in competition and obviously queerness, although their approaches are very different. Um, for you, how do you make that differentiation when you write different characters? Is that like a conscious thing for you? Like this character is going to do this and this one is not, or how do you, how do you go about it? Yeah, it's really, well, I was sort of spoiled because Verona Comics, um, I knew, which was last year's release, I knew I wanted to do dual POV and their voices are so different. Um, Ridley is such an anxious mess that there's no way you, you could ever mix him up with Jubilee. Like never would you be like, what chapter am I in? Um, so I was like, okay, this is so easy. I don't know why people are like, Oh, dual POV is so complicated. And then I wrote, like you said, two mm -hmm. girls who are both competitive <laughs> in the same high school. Um, and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. No, this, this sucks a little. <laughs> like, this actually is kind of hard. Um, so music is like a really big part of my writing process. So for me, it was really nailing down two completely different playlists. Um, they like really different, um, you know, they relate to the world really differently. Um, so it was really just trying to get in their heads and coming up with little tricks to do that. You know, like one of the things that I do when I'm first starting to like, not, not when I'm drafting, but when I'm just sort of still daydreaming about the book is I do a lot of things to sort of live with the character so I could see how they would interact. So I'll watch movies that they would love and listen to songs that they would love or pick up like a mechanic magazine that, that she would love or, you know, learn about different types of soaps that mechanics use that won't dry out their hands because she has to be a beauty queen the next day. So those little things really helped, I think, I hope make their voice mm -hmm. sound very distinct and authentic because once you really get into their heads like that, the, the things that, you know, Ruby is going to say, even, you know, even the way that she's like thinking of metaphors and relating to things is going to be completely different because she just has a totally different frame of reference, but it was hard. This time was really <laughs> hard. Um, and my next one, I, I deliberately took a break and just wrote single POV. Good for uh, you. <laughs> You've earned it. Okay. I am going <laughs> to take a little breather on this one. I'm just going to deal with one girl's head. That's so. legit. That's fair. You have totally <laughs> earned it. I'm glad you eventually understood the difficulty. It's real. It's a real thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And speaking of the journey of your books, um, so something that I think is really interesting about your body of work as it fits in queer YA is I think for so many people writing like a coming out novel tends to be their entrance into queer YA, partly because I think it just feels like a natural starting point. Um, and partly because for so long that kind of was the only way to get to write queer YA. 
Like it, it had to be a coming out novel because like nothing else could be parsed, you know, like right. that was just, oh, oh, we, we get how that fits in. It has to be that specific like coming of age story. And you came at it from such a different angle where queerness is not like a big, um, like kind of stumbling block in, in, in your stories until this book. So I'm curious how you view sort of um, your evolution um, as a queer YA author and kind of, it's not going backwards, obviously, like there's no backwards about it and, and coming out, you know, and these issues happen at any time. Um, but sort of the process of, of this direction of your journey, I think is really cool. And I would love to hear more about that. Yeah. Oh, that's such a really interesting, good question. No one has ever <laughs> asked me anything. Like I've that. been thinking about it for days. I'm like, I don't know how to ask this in like a really articulate fashion. I feel like she'll get it, but I don't no. know like the right way to word it. I just know that I think it's something really interesting about how you have um, approached your work and the order of your books um, is it's really unusual. Yeah, I never thought of, you know, I, I really, it, it wasn't, Handling it for each book was a deliberate choice. So I don't want to say it wasn't a deliberate choice, but um, when I came in with Hot Dog Girl, I really wanted to come, I came in kind of like hot, like I was a little bit heated because I had been told when I was querying, you know, queer girls don't sell, which obviously, especially this year, we have seen. Yeah. We're doing all right, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we have it, we have it under control. Um, so with Hot Dog Girl, I really was just like, I just want a queer rom-com where nobody cares that they're, you know, it's just completely uh, uh, just a fake dating rom-com like you would get on, you know, Netflix. You know, so that was really, I, I didn't want coming out to be a part of it. I wanted to just see a fun, messy, because that was another thing is that I feel like a lot of the times we get, it's, it's gotten much better. But even two years ago when Hot Dog Girl came out, there was a lot of just like perfect marshmallow. You couldn't be angry. You couldn't be messy. And especially for girls. Um, I don't think we've come quite as far with letting girls be messy as we have from like queer in general stories to be messy, but um, I just really wanted to tell like a super messy, real story and let them have their happily ever after. Um, and then for some girls do, you know, for, for Verona comics, I also was kind of doing that where they were both like very in control of their queerness. They were coming out at it a little bit different because we had Jubilee and Verona Comics who was wrestling with, you know, is she queer enough? Um, you know, and then for this one, I just, coming out is never, you're just never done. Like you, you choose forever. Um, every new person you meet for the rest of your life, you have, you know, is this a safe person to come out to? Is this, um, you know, so I'm like, okay, I want to, I want to talk about that. And I also want to talk about the privilege of coming out. And I think we've got some really, really great coming out love stories. Um, but I also really wanted to show that coming out in a large, like a loud, huge way, isn't everyone's end goal. Um, it's not, you know, there's not a right way to be out. And so, you know, Morgan has a very, very supportive family um, who would pretty much go to the end of the earth to take care of her and make her feel loved and supported. And, um, and Ruby doesn't have that at all. So even though they both recognize their queerness, their relationship to their queerness could not be more opposite. And that's a story that I, I think we don't see a ton of. Um, we don't see a ton of, well, it's actually, it's okay to not come out and you can still figure this out. And that's something that queer teens deal with a lot because they don't have that autonomy. You know, they're reliant on their parents for survival, food, money. Most of them, you know, most teens, if their parents are like, we're going to cut you off if you step out of line, that's it. They, they can't step out of line. Um, so I really wanted to show how you can navigate a situation like that and how a happily ever after 
um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean screaming I'm gay from, you know, the top of a mountain, you know, to the entire school. Um, sometimes it can be really, really different and it still is extremely valid and, and you can still sort of have your epic love story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I keep seeing your nails and I am wondering, do they match your book cover? They do. <laughs> you always have the most amazing nails going on on Instagram yeah. and I had to know what so, are you wearing yeah so these are <laughs> not so sorry that was such a shift from your wonderful serious answer <laughs> yeah so but they're just so noticed I'm, my nails look like this so <laughs> it was like one chip tan one hand never attempted <laughs> I like do my nails when I'm on long work zooms that are like one-sided so <laughs> So I'm very envious of your nails. But. Yes, so she, so my best friend, I've had the same best friend since I was 12. And uh, her name is Shannon. And she actually, even though she has this like crazy important grown up job with the teacher's retirement union, she somehow fell, ax, totally accidentally became um, like a nail Instagram, which is like Instagram. So she is a nail influencer. She is like a super important nail influencer on Instagram, just out of the blue. Um, this was like our pandemic hobby. She obviously <laughs> much better at it than me because now she gets like- I don't know, you're who I think of when it comes to like books oh. and nails. Well, she actually custom made these colors to <gasps> match my book cover. Oh. Um, I have another set that mm -hmm. I'll do next week before, cause I've been doing exclusively winter soldier from the Falcon and winter soldier show. <laughs> I've been doing exclusively winter soldier themed manicures. And then, um, I remembered my, you know, my book is coming out right. I need to <laughs> somewhere um, in MS. Um, yeah, so I have one more set of colors that she made for me, but she actually custom made, them so cool. to match and um yeah and she's nails by shannon b on instagram so I'll just <laughs> <laughs> Little plug. She, nice. she also she also did a some girls do manny which i put in my stories yesterday but my story sort of like exploded so um but her some girls do manny is like very intense it's very good i want to see i gotta go look do you have any say in your covers? I love your covers. I like, I think they're awesome. And I feel like they were very early on the illustrated cover trend. Um, when like not every, now, now if you write a contemporary YA, it obviously absolutely 100% has to be illustrated. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that wasn't the case necessarily for Hot Dog Girl. Um, but I mean, I love that cover. I love all three of your covers. Have you had anything to do with them? Or are they just like show you the perfection and you're like, yeah. No. I have, I mean, I'm not going to take too much credit because definitely the, the art director and my illustrator, Jeff Osberg is amazing. Um, we have worked together for three books now. Um, we've kind of developed a friendship. Um, and yeah, for Hot Dog Girl, which is this cover right here, I actually did have a say. Um, the first design that was sent to me, like we really weren't on the same page. And what happens most of the time is your publisher is like, too bad. Like this is what we're going with. Um, but we talked about it and they were extremely just super receptive, um, which is extremely lucky. Like I cannot stress enough how lucky that is to have a team that's that supportive and has your back and willing to make changes, you know, to concepts. And so I literally was like, I really want to work with Jeff. And they were like, all right, let's see if he's around. And I was like, did that just happen? Mm -hmm. uh, and then my other big request was that um, I really wanted it to be like by flag colors. That was my next question. So, I was curious. So that's really, you know, a lot of where I wanted to lead was I was curious because I absolutely stole that from you for cool for the summer. I was like, like hot dog girl, how it's bi coded. I want that. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> they're color coordinated right they are aren't they beautiful next to each other um but I love that and you've actually some girls do is not only the first book where like queerness is like you know more of an issue um but the first one where it's not 
passable as under the gaydar, I think, um, which is, I think, just one of the most interesting conversations in YA because I feel like there is no right answer. Um, you know, should books be super queer looking so that you know how to find it and you can easily spot it on a shelf and take it home? Um, but then what if it's not safe for you? But then how will you find it if it's not? So I, I feel like with your bi flag coding, you found like the perfect way around it. Um, but I am curious in general, if you found that your books did find, you know, their intended queer audiences, whether or not, you know, they've been sort of open and out there in the same way that some girls do is definitely vibing a little more between the colors and the picture and the, you know, and the- Yeah, that one was a little more in, uh, uh, some girls do is definitely a, a little more out there, a little more out um, yeah. in honor of, you know, Morgan, who's super mm -hmm. out. Um, but yeah, it was really, it was really deliberate with Hot Dog Girl because I was really worried about uh, the kids that needed this book, you know, the messy, you, you know, I mean, anyone, but particularly yeah. messy kids that might not have the best home life, you know, because Lou and Hot Dog Girl doesn't have, you know, she has an absentee mom. Um, I wanted any kid to be able to bring it home that and not have any parents questioning it unless they were really you know like look it, I mean if they're gonna really research it that much there's nothing I mean it's super gay but yeah. <laughs> but yeah that was really why I wanted to do the colors why I asked for the bi colors was so that like I'm like well if you know you know like um but yeah, so I think they have really found their audience. Um, I was surprised by um, Verona Comics uh, really did get embraced by like a, a lot of queer teens. I think I hear surprisingly, um, I, I get the most emails about that one. And that one is, um, you know, that's this cover for anyone who doesn't know the paperback just came out, uh, like a month ago. I don't know. Time is a flat circle, but semi-recently <laughs> this paperback came out. Um, but it's not, you know, that one is, is the, I think the least queer coded of everything, even though it still has two bi main characters, but people are finding them. I'd like to think that people are really just know that they're going to get a lot of queerness in my books now when they see my name. Um, but, but I do think, um, you know, hot dog girl and some girls do had an easier time finding their, their audience, like from the jump. Um, so yeah, so I think there's been like some difference, but, but we'll, we get there. Yeah. Word of mouth <laughs> gets the queerness out. Um, and speaking of Verona comics, a question that's obviously fun for me. So I was actually not expecting Verona comics to be as Romeo and Juliet as it was. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it goes harder on that than people give it credit for, um, which I thought was very cool. Um, obviously. Um, but I am curious if you could, or maybe you already have plans to um, queer up any other classic works for a YA novel, what would it be and why? Oh man, I don't know. I think, well, I recently texted you actually. Mm -hmm. It was like asking you about, because um, the great thing about being friends with Dahlia is that sometimes <laughs> if you don't overdo it, you can use her as your LGBTQ reads. <laughs> <laughs> She's very, um, you know, if you were, even though you were like, I did do a post on this, um, but I was saying, I wasn't oh. like chiding you. I just wanted you to know the information was all there with links to Goodreads. <laughs> yeah. Um, I really, uh, I recently read and blurbed this amazing um, book set. It's called Accomplished. It's coming out in 2022. Um, and it is a Pride and Prejudice. It's set in the Pride and Prejudice. Um, world, but it's from Georgie Darcy, his little sister's perspective. Um, and it does have some queer side characters, but the second I finished it, I was like, oh my God, I just want to write like the queerest Pride and Prejudice on earth, like immediately. <laughs> um, so that is one that I would love to do. I'm also obsessed with um, Rebecca and I would love mm. to do 
some kind of, you know, Rebecca retell. I don't know. I would just like to take all of the classics and make them very, very gay. I think. Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> I think that would really, and it really, any of them, give me any of them. Okay. <laughs> you know, put me in coach. I'm ready. Yay. There's, I mean, there's been a lot of um, classics retellings from more marginalized perspectives, but yes. there's definitely still that some that have yet to be queer. There was a great Rebecca one recently um but not queer there oh yes yeah. are you talking about yeah. I can Zoe Spano yes yes I read that I did not know that was a Rebecca retelling and I had it on my audio and I finally got a break from blur books and I'm like started listening to it and I get like a little few chapters in and I was like a total like shocked Pikachu like <laughs> I was so hyped because that's one of my favorites that's one of my favorite stories isn't that the best but speaking of things, well, I don't want to say things you blurred because that sounds leading, but in general, <laughs> why is you recommend? Let's take a little break and talk about some that you love because that is my favorite subject. Yes. I must have some recommendations stored I up. I do. I do. I actually have a stack on my desk. Mm. Uh, well, this first, <laughs> I don't know if you've seen this. I was not is... leading to it. I swear. <laughs> uh, if you look on the back, there is a blurb. Not that she, not that this is where she was going, but I did blurb <laughs> this book. Um, this is one of my favorite books of the year. Wow. It's super bi. Um, definitely get this. Everyone should get it. <laughs> uh, no bias at all. Huh? No. Bias. See what I did there. Um, another book that came out yesterday that I am, I did blurb this too, actually, and I'm obsessed with is- I am also obsessed with it. Um, it's so, so good. good. I've been trying to push it in everything I do. I'm going to make like a special post for it. Um, because I don't know, like, I don't want this one to fall under the radar. Cause that's what so I keep good. saying. It's like, exactly. You see it happening and you're like, no. I right. will not let you go like, under the radar. You are too good. Yeah, it's <laughs> However, so I, good. And, and I so told clear. Rachel yeah. yesterday, I was asking about it and, um, you know, I'm like, stack this book. <laughs> uh, this is queer. I should probably say something about what it is other than yes I guess I why not uh, I mean um, frankly the fact that we both love it should be enough for everybody but if it's not yeah so it is um it's like a girl band uh and two people in it used to date and so not only did the band break up but they have broken up and now they're getting together for this like charity reunion they're suddenly in each other's lives again and it is messy and awkward and fun and there's songs it's great yeah and they're all queer and one of them is non-binary so then there's also that added exploration of when you build your identity as a girl band what happens when you're not all girls can you build yourselves up you know can you right. reunite but be something else um and yeah ah it's so good it's so good yeah. it's so <laughs> it's so good and then my last track would be this one comes out in I haven't June. read it you haven't read it okay. I I have it but I haven't read it yet so because it was originally I... coming out in July and I I wasn't touching my July books yet <laughs> so yeah, this, is this poison heart I do want to warn you that it's a duology which I forgot about yeah. And then the book ends and I was literally texting Kaylin, like, I will, I need you to immediately call me and tell me the rest of the book. <laughs> um, but this one, what I love about Kaylin, her books are super queer. Um, she Cinderella also, is dead is her other one for anyone who's yes. not familiar. Yes. Yeah. And I'm obsessed. I just did an interview with uh, culture S, I think. And they were like, do you have a book wreck? And I wrote like an entire, I don't know how they're going <laughs> to I wrote like an entire essay about her books. Um, but definitely get this one. This one deals with like Greek mythology. The first one mm -hmm. dealt with the Cinderella fairy tale. Um, and she takes everything that you think, you know, all the common knowledge uses all these common things that you totally like are like, oh, I know this. And then she flips them on your, their head completely. It's amazing. She's so good. Yeah, so those are my biggest like must read, order immediately, put them on so, display at Northshire. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Little pressure. Excellent choices. Um, okay, so I want to go back to your crafting again, um, but this one is a little more of the literal how. So I feel like every time that we text, you are sitting in a car. <laughs> Yeah. Like, 
running your entire authorial business out of it. Um, how do you do that? Like, how much of your writing do you actually do sitting in a car waiting outside? Like, <laughs> So and how do you do it when you need to research? I mean, that's, that's what kills it for me. I mean, besides the fact that I don't have a license, like how do you, how do you <laughs> get all the pieces together? I'm, I'm like dying to know this. This like boggles my mind about you. Yeah, I have like, I have sort of like a writer bug out bag that I keep stocked with like my pens and, and like all that kind of stuff. So that's always, it's basically like an author diaper bag. Like I'm very prepared. Um, and like scrap paper, if I need to like write extra stuff, every book I write has its own notebook. I am the author that actually does use their fancy notebook. So, um, so that makes it easy because everything is in one place like any notes to myself that I make while I'm working um and then I upgraded my cell phone plan to have a hot spot so I can run my laptop off of it um I love picturing this yeah and so I really have it down <clears throat> if I slightly recline my seat and put it all the way in the farthest back position and sit crisscross applesauce I can then use my author diaper bag as a desk and put my laptop on it. Um, so I really truly do have it down to a science at this point. Um, I know where to park in the various parking lots, um, where the sun is gonna be at certain times of day. <laughs> like at this point, it's just so much of my life is sitting outside of places um, waiting for my family that I've just had to adapt, you know, even, in the before times, you know, I used to be able to go inside and do things like on bleachers or things like that. Um, but I think I've adapted. I've made my car office work. Um, Clearly. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I always have my, <clears throat> I, I always have my notebook, my laptop, and then I have a blurb book because if my mind starts to wander too much, then I will just stop what I'm doing and read. And then I'm like, I'm still technically working. Either. That totally counts as working. Right. 100%. I yeah. say as somebody who currently owes five blurbs, <laughs> definitely counts. Yeah. Yeah. I had four, I have four due June 1st and one due June 15th. And I'm like, all right, I gotta. I don't I even remember. Read June these. <laughs> like they're suddenly coming in waves like you don't get one at a time anymore it's just like one day three come it's all good yeah, <laughs> but I don't think people realize quite how productive you are in a car okay so forgive me because I don't remember how much of what you have coming you can share but um maybe you can share some things and tease some things and um give people an idea of how much you are actually accomplishing in that car and also branching out yeah, there's a lot of things. There are a lot of things in the pipeline. Um, one thing that I can talk about is next year Coven comes out, which is my only officially announced project so far for 2022. Um, it'll be out in August, and that is a um, that is a graphic novel full of queer witches. I'm working with Kit Seaton, who's amazing. I cannot wait till we, you, like, I cannot wait till we can start showing you guys teasers. It's, uh, her work is amazing. And there's, you know, there's a grumpy cat in it that literally like steals the show. I can't even handle it. <laughs> you know, if anybody who knows me knows how obsessed I am with cats. So when I wrote this cat in, cause when, when you're working in graphic novels, and you have panels, they call them like talking head panels where it's just, you have to get a bunch of dialogue. You have to get really creative to make it not look boring. So for me, the easiest way to do that is to put in a cat because I love the cat. And I can be like, you know, in the background, the cat is like pawing something or stepping on them. Mm -hmm. And so it's like this fun trick that writers of graphic novels do just to keep it visually interested. And so her art is so amazing. Um, 
So I'm super excited about that. That one is uh, like a California teen witch who's kind of living a normal life away from her cousin. And then there's a murder and <clears throat> her family has to move back to upstate New York. So she's completely landlocked after being this little surfer girl. Um, and she has to rejoin her cousin. And then she decides the easiest way is just solve this murder herself so she can get back because the obviously her, she thinks you know she's 16 her parents have no idea what they're doing so um and hilarity ensues and it's a great like found family coming of age super queer graphic novel um i do have as i mentioned i have a single pov <laughs> ya book which i've mentioned i think we'll be announcing that hopefully pretty soon we've settled on the title uh so I think I see that Lizzie is in here, who is my publicist. So um, I'm gonna try, I'm trying to behave. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm so excited about it. I could say that it is another like queer girl rom-com um, messiness. Um, and then there are several other things that are in the work <laughs> um, that I don't know how publishing works if anybody doesn't know is that these things happen. And then a lot of times we can't actually talk about them for like two years. One of the things that just happened that I'm so excited about, I, I honestly do think it's gonna be probably another year and a half before I could talk about it. But I think uh, you'll definitely be hearing about some of this stuff soon. And I am looking into kind of branching out. I wrote, um, you know, nothing has happened with this, but I am exploring like queer adult romance um so that is something that's very much on my radar um but that is really right now just like a whisper of a thing that's not even like a thing that remotely exists but i mean if you need somebody to whisper really loudly do it do it do it do it do it <laughs> in your ear by which i mean your text inbox like every week or so um i am prepared to take that on <laughs> um yeah, no, I can do that for you because that's how much I care. But it really is wild how much I'm like, every time we text and like Jen mentioned something new, I'm like, can you just remind me which of the 50 things that is and if it's secret and is it like. Yeah, I have a spreadsheet because I don't even know. Like I was writing up a, a I was writing up a tweet, a tweet teaser. That is a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> And then I realized like this project is not even remote. Like I could, this project is not even remotely public. Like, and I'm about to just, cause I was working on it and I was so excited <laughs> uh, and I had worked in an yeah. Easter egg and I'm like, ah, I'm going to tell people about this. And I'm like, <laughs> no, not even close. No, I'm going to just text Dahlia this <laughs> Easter egg. Thank you. Easter eggs that. are my favorite. Yes. Yes. Do you have ones that you love in your books? Yeah, well, I did. I can't um, talk about it. <laughs> I do. And some girls do. Um, I have. Uh, she goes to an LGBTQ center and they're sorting book donations because they're making like a queer YA library in the book. And she picks up a book and she starts describing the cover and she's like, oh, it's a boy and his dog and there's all these post-it notes and, you know, and they talk about it a little like just as how, you know, if she falls for the book, she can keep it. And that is, you know, How to Be Remy Cameron by Julian Winters, which is one of my favorite books. It's the book okay. that I donate that book all the time. Anytime, I usually have extra copies because anytime that uh, like a center, or any place reaches out and asks for my book, I always send in like a couple extra. Um, and that's one that I like, it's just deals so, with a boy, you know, trying to find his identity and the post-it notes represent like different facets of his identity. And um, it just explores it so well. I think he would be great friends with Ruby to tie it back to my book. Um, so there's that. And then they also watch a rom-com. Uh, in the beginning, they are about to watch a rom-com, but it gets interrupted. And that's actually a, uh, like a movie that Becky Albertalli and I made up ourselves and told each other to be fun. Uh, we were, that's what we do. She even made a poster for it, which I think I'll see if I can get her to actually like post that publicly. That's amazing. 
Um, but yeah, so those are a couple and she that is now public knowledge because she brought it up uh, last night when we, we <laughs> live and she's like, should we tell them about our movie? Because we cast it. I mean, we went all in one night. We were just this is what you know, this is what you think it's it's such a glamorous life that authors lead. And <laughs> We're really just texting each other. Uh-huh. Like, and then Madeline Pesh walks in. <laughs> like, it's just complete nerdiness. Like, there's nothing. <laughs> I'm just throwing out there that if the three of us ever actually manage to do a physical event, I want this poster there. I demand <laughs> it. I require it. I'll get, I'll try to find it. That would be really funny. If I could find it, we'll, we'll come to Northshire and we'll hang the poster behind our event. Honestly, I'm fine to just start acting this movie out in front of everyone. I have no acting skills, um, but also very little shame. So I am, I am ready to do this. I am on it. Amazing. Cause it is a love triangle between three people. So there would be a part for each of us maybe and instead of Rachel maybe next year instead of an author visit we do like a community theater 100 <laughs> percent. I'm sold sounds fantastic I love this I love everything about this <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so those are those are definitely the two like biggest easter eggs but usually in my books I have nerdy things that I love like in hot dog girl um, I referenced my favorite episode of Doctor Who um, in, um, you know, in Verona Comics, they have an argument about who is the best Robin um, for Batman and Robin, which is an argument that happens literally every single Comic-Con. Like I do a lot of Comic-Cons because I also write comics um, in the before times uh, when we were doing physical events and that argument erupts every single event because Batman has had like 5,000 Robins. Isn't it Burt Ward? No? No, he's got, well, I mean, yes. He's but he, yes. <laughs> uh, um, no. He's the one from the TV show that yeah. I remember watching when I was really little, even though it was technically a before my time TV show, but I like how you just like froze. Like, what are yeah. you talking about? Like, my name has never even entered the conversation as a possibility. I don't even remember any others except for like Chris O'Donnell. Yeah, no, but the it's not Chris O'Donnell. The characters themselves. He has not only had not only have we had five hundred Batman actors, but Batman in the books can't even keep the same Robin. They end up dying or leaving or becoming their own superheroes. That's sad. So he can't keep a Robin. No, he can't. Wow. Yeah, I'm learning something new. I'm very not a comic nerd. My comics <laughs> kind of start and end with Archie. So I'm learning a lot right now. Archie Thanks. is a gateway the comic. comic. This is the first comic I ever read. Yeah, it was like my gateway, but then it shut the door behind it and was like, you're done. Oh, no. <laughs> but I am getting more into graphic novels, which I'm very excited about. So I am super excited to jump into yours. And if you have any favorite recommendations, I'm sure we will all happily take them. Oh gosh, there's so many um oh I just am thinking of everyone's names and not the name Trung just wrote one magic fish magic fish yeah Yeah, I'm like (laughs) I see the cover so magic fish is amazing um this is another one I donate all the time taproot by Kizzy Young which is a super um queer um it's a romance between a gardener and a ghost and it's just um the gardener doesn't want to give up uh, the love of that person and it has a happily ever after it is a romance uh, it is a true okay. romance um so yeah there's just oh gosh there's so many I'm just, but th- those are the ones that you have to um immediately read that's fair I will throw moon cakes out there by Suzanne Walker and Wendy Shu. that and flamer by Mike Curado are my and the magic fish are like my trifecta until Coven comes along and then yeah. I will have a fourth acta. <laughs> yeah. I really look forward to it. And I'm really looking forward to Squad by Maggie Takuda Hall. Definitely have to give that a shout too. Yeah. Not that I, seen, I can't um, have recommendations without giving 50 of them. <laughs> yeah. I love, I just love how we're, we're starting to see like more and more like YA graphic novels. Um, I love, I love that that's like really exploding because that is a really good 
you know, there are just some people who can't sit down and absorb a full print story. Um, and so even from an accessibility issue, um, graphic novels are amazing and they absolutely, you know, it drives me nuts when it, someone says that doesn't count as reading. Like that's absolutely reading. It's so maddening. Uh, I'm like, also the, the visual nature, it's not even just like a, they can't absorb a full story, but the visual nature just adds more for some readers. Like right. it's not, it's not particularly how my brain works. Although I do love graphic novels now as I, as I actually read them and I'm like, oh, hold on. These are fantastic. Um, you know, because I did kind of have in my head the thing like, yeah, these are for, you know, if, if I don't want to read so much words, like, <laughs> but it's just so not what they are. It's just, you know, like a story made complete with illustration and it's, yeah, it's oh, they're beautiful. Um, you know, Kit, I consider Kit, who is my artist and coven, like she is, I truly do see her as a co-writer because everything from her, the body language, you know, some of it I was able to um, really choreograph, um, but I also was very clear, like, go off, you know, this is your area of expertise, so you're not tied to my stage directions, um, but it, it just brings so much to it. All of the tiny details, like you talked about the tiny details and some girls do, um, just altering someone's eyebrows can completely change the way it reads. It's, it's just so fun. It's so, so fun. Did you come to graphic novels like from comics? Is that, did that just feel like a natural transition for you or did it feel like you were taking on something that was totally new for you? Um, no, it was really, so what happened was, um, so I have a comic series called Circadia. It's a, like, a, it's a complete mini series that I put on Kickstarter, which is a crowdfunding site. Um, and so it was very, very successful and popular on that. And I was shipping myself by hand, like hundreds of comics a week. And so Coven originally was going to be my follow-up comic to that. And I was just talking to Stephanie, who is my editor. And I'm like, I just absolutely like cannot keep mailing these comics. And she was like, well, if you ever want to, you know, talk about that. Um, That's the ideal right there. Yeah. And I'm like, you want to take over shipping? My life? <laughs> I was so excited. I'm like, we could definitely make this. And it, but the experience has been so completely different. Um, you know, I was really excited because Stephanie Pitts, who's my editor, we work so well together and I was so comfortable with her. Um, so I was really excited. I knew she would push the story and she really did help me develop it in really uh, amazing ways. Um, but it is really different. A graphic novel is really different from comics because in comics, I'm very worried about telling the story in 20 to 22 pages, ending on a cliffy so they buy the next issue, you know, get in and get out. What do they actually have to know? Um, and then the graphic novel is a lot more like writing a regular novel where you, I have room to stretch out and, and um, yeah. 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 So it was really different. Every, like every step of the way I was, I was really surprised at how different it was. Um, and it was really fun. It, it is really fun. And I'm very excited. I'm very excited to see the end product. I can't, I can't believe it's finally going to be here. So it's in publishing so soon next year. Yeah. <laughs> You know, these things feel forever away and then they happen before you know it and then they're over so fast and you're like wait I miss when I was waiting like anticipating that happening and then it, <laughs> it's fine um I think we have to be up to questions I don't want to yes yep I don't want to great audience questions that I could listen to the okay. two of you talk all night this has been so much fun um, the first one is from Manu, who's writing in from Argentina. So definitely, Ooh. I would guess, our furthest guest. So hi, Manu. Um, and she asks both of you, what are some of your favorite romance tropes to write? Ooh. Well, I love when there's, um, I love like miscommunication, which all my books have like a lot of. Um, <laughs> I love... Um, you know, I love like rivals to romance a lot. 
That's definitely a favorite. I love like the funnier ones, like Grump and Sunshine and Only One Bed. I don't want to steal them all. I love all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I love really tropey things. Yeah. So. It's funny because I find that the ones I write the most frequently are not actually my favorites. And so then I'll like turn around and, you know, I'll think of like, you ask me my favorite romance tropes and I'll be like, enemies to lovers, Sunshine Grump, like, I know those are my favorites, but then if you look at what I write the most and it's like second chance romance, um, <laughs> the pool for the summer is that and right of first refusal is that. And I'm like, wait, what? Like, how did this become <laughs> like the thing I do? That's not even something I think I'm interested in. And yet here I go, having done it twice. Um, what was fun for cool for the summer, which is like, was scary because it's like the most hated one in YA was doing a love triangle. Um, <laughs> I mean, you, you know the scariness. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, it's really tough to please people with how you handle it. Um, but I feel like if people like your love triangle, which so far people seem to, as far as I hear about um, Cool for the Summer, then like that's a really fun one to do when you feel like you've gotten it right and somehow please people with it. Would I take a chance at doing it again? Not for a while um yeah I think opposites you know some variation on opposites attract is probably my favorite you know if you put what I love to read and what I love to write that probably peaks at at some variation of opposites attract whether that's like sunshine grump or play a virgin or you know just like going <laughs> I know that's like a cheesy one but you know what I did it without boys and <laughs> gets to stand out for that um I think that's that's probably comes out to my favorite you know the intersection of both. Nice. Yeah. Um, a question here from Isabel, which I adore. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, and it's sort of a favorite in the chat. Everyone else is like, <laughs> um, if the girls from Some Girls Do and the girls from Cool for the, for the Summer met, who would click the best? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that is a good question that I have to leave to you. No, I don't know. <laughs> oh, you do have to leave it to me because you have. <laughs> Oh my God, that's an impossible question. <laughs> well, I can add I feel in like as a we're just in for an awkward, I think we're in for an awkward double date to start. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, yeah. I think that's where we're kicking off because like there's not actually that much in common there. That's true. Their, their hobbies are really different. They're like Laura and Jasmine are so kind of like specifically non-competitive, like neither one is interested or has the energy, which is funny because it's like the exact opposite of my next book, um, <laughs> which is much closer to some girls do. Um, yeah, they're really like, I'm like a little sad. We wrote girls. I don't know if they would be tight. Yeah, I think they would be like, I honestly think it would be like, mm, well, our moms are good friends. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. It would be that kind of thing. Or like, yeah, it'd be like we're oh, the queer we're girls talking. here and everybody yeah. feels like we have to be. <laughs> that's who they would be. Oh my God, that's so sad. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to coordinate better with <laughs> future releases oh yes yes that's fine I think the some girls do girls and the home field advantage girls which is the tentative title for my next book would actually be friends I feel good about that and I think yeah. you know I think my redacted girls and my cool for the summer I think we flip-flopped the year okay. honestly Ask all right so when we're doing our paperback here. releases we'll, yes. <laughs> we'll work on this I'll make a note of it for that we'll event be more strategic comes. yeah <laughs> Um, similarly, Kate asked um, if your characters could hang out with characters from another piece of media, who would they hang out with? Oh my gosh. Well, my girls are obsessed with K Stu and Madeline Pesh. So they would want to go to like Riverdale or Twilight or just anywhere in Hollywood. Um, so there's definitely that. As an author, I always say, I've said this several times that I always want my characters to hang out with the crows from Six of Crows. And I just think it would be really fun. Um, you know, in Hot Dog Girl, I just really wanted to see Kaz like let loose. He could wear the hot dog suit because, you know, it's all gloves. So there would be that comfort level. It's my favorite. Um, 
and you know it, it would just be very I think it would be very funny to see the crows come to like have to deal with suburbia it would just make me so happy and my characters could kind of be like this is a scone um we're just gonna eat the hot cocoa there's no <laughs> eyeballs are staying where they where they currently are um so that would be my dream crossover what about you I think Laura and Jasmine would like love to spend a day in Schitt's Creek and hang out oh, in Rose Apothecary and like definitely go to the cafe and Laura can practice um, making little latte art behind the counter. <laughs> but I feel like they would just like love being there for a day and going shopping with Alexis or at least fashion comparing with Alexis I feel like she and Jasmine would have like a lot to talk about um I definitely think they would be friends so that's my dream for them to get a day in Schitt's Creek or even like a week I feel like they could handle a week they could be okay in a grungy hotel room as long as motel room as long as they were there together yeah and they need time to write their like little bit of Alexis verses yes so they can yes. add to the, so. definitely um, I think Laura would require approximately like half a beer before she started performing a little bit of <laughs> A little bit of Laura. She's there. I see it. I see it. And I love it. <laughs> and then we'll yeah. swing by in like a minivan with the crows. I'm into it. I'm into it. There's <laughs> definitely a place for them in Schitt's Creek somewhere. I see it. <laughs> I love it. Um, we are just about out of time, but there's a last really great question from Valerie that I'd love to get to before we wrap up. Um, she asks, while queer YA lit and particularly romances still seems to lean gay, thanks to authors like both of you, we're beginning to see works that represent more than just the first two letters of LGBTQ+. What are some queer identities or stories and themes that you'd like to see in the teen romance spotlight? I would love to see, we're starting to see some really um, cool like trans romances. Um, I would like to see more of that. And I would like to see more, um, you know, POC, like I would like to see more Thanks. representation um, yeah. of that because, uh, you know, intersectionality of that and queerness, I think we still see, even though we're seeing a lot of girls, I think we still see most of the marketing go to like white queer girls. Um, and so I'd love to see more like, uh, Kate, like Kaylin's book, Cinderella's Dead and, mm. and, um, you know, where we see a big push for, for like queer black girls and, and things like that. So I would love to see major marketing for, for that. Yes. Agreed. More, more queer girl couples where neither one is white, like stars in the blackness and the blackness between them or, um, it's not like it's a secret. So yes, mm -hmm. definitely more there. Also, there's like so many great trans guy romances out this year, but trans girls are still seeing almost nothing. Um, I don't know if there's been a like major publisher trans girl book since Pet, which was 2019. Um, so would definitely love to see more of that. Um, and more... I, I would definitely be interested to see more like a romantic representation that's not also asexual. So mixing up romantic and sexual orientations and, you know, kind of clarifying that those are not the same thing um, would be really great. Um, more on page pansexual rap, always, always requested by people. I mean, so I tend to know what people are looking for from, um, I run LGBTQ reads and on the, um, there's a Tumblr where you can request whatever um, kind of representation you want. You know, do you know of any like lesbian pirate books is like a common request, for example. <laughs> um, so there's just so you, many things. What are, um, do you know of lesbian pirate books? Um, <laughs> I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I was just like, um, I would really like to read that. <laughs> uh, the Abyss Surrounds Us by Emily Skretsky um, is, is lesbian pirate. They might be Space pirate and not sea pirate. Um, I know there are some queer characters in Natalie Parker's Sea Fire series. Mm -hmm. um, Valerie yeah, just in I, the chat recommended Raven yeah. the Pirate Princess graphic novels, which there you go. That See, title, I, think... I am sold. I'm going to be looking this up <laughs> definitely. Um, um, and for a great bi gender or gender fluid pirate, going back to Maggie to Hall, I love um, 
Oh my God, it's a long title and I'm like messing it up now with like the witch, the mermaid, the witch and the sea. Um, okay. So good, so good for, for pirates. Um, yes, so, so there's, yes, there's a lot of recommendations like, oh, middle grade, oh, I, guess, I don't know if the question was why is specific, but more queer middle grade fantasy. I'm going to throw that out there in case anyone in publishing or any writers are listening. More queer middle grade fantasy, please. Um, and Isabel. more queer books that are not romance. Um, Isabel I will, I will is here, so she in. could do the queer fantasy. Isabel Sterling. Yes. Yes. So you got to age it down one category. I mean, queer YA fantasy now is amazing, especially sapphic. Yeah. Um, but we could use more middle grade and more um, trans identities in fantasy. It's basically like what happens as queer categories bloom is that they bloom in contemporary. They bloom in white, non-disabled, yeah. <laughs> contemporary um and then they branch out in like maybe one identity there and eventually they go to fantasy but you just don't get it all at once so let's more more of the all at once I mean there's a lot of awesome stuff coming I will plug my own site lgbtqreads.com <laughs> come see what's coming um yeah ah there we go Isabel I may have there you go middle grade paranormal bring it on yeah, Speaking of Natalie Parker, I know she has one coming and Nina Varela has a queer middle grade fantasy too, but um, yeah, I will. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's one of those questions that sent me off for an hour and I, I know we're over time, sorry. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, it's why you are such an indispensable resource. Mm -hmm. I, I really was not joking about the fact that, because I'll sometimes mm -hmm. get questions from customers in the store where I'm like, I have no idea what lesbian pirate YA books. And it, it, I do go to your blog all the time for those questions. It I wish I had more really lesbian pirate books. Okay, now, now, now we need more. I'm gonna yes. submit and ask. So you have to do like a post. Yeah, all right, <laughs> I'll do it. I, I have something like it. Maybe it's just queer pirates. All right, I'll find specific. That, that works too. Pirates. Yes, yes. All right, more pirate books coming. Yes. <laughs> As I well, crash out here. Thank you both so much for taking the time to talk tonight. This has been truly a wonderfully fun evening. Um, you can order both Some Girls Do and Cool for the Summer at Northshire.com. Um, join us for more Northshire Live events coming up. Um, a fun one that this group might really enjoy is Nicholas B. Dimitio for um, Burn It All Down mm. on Monday, May 24th, which is going to be a lot of fun. Come on back for that. Um, Jen and Dahlia, thank you so, so much. And then thank you. Dahlia. Thank and, you. Uh, and happy release week, Jen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm excited to get my newly signed copy. Everyone else can join me in getting one if you haven't yet. Yes, the link's yeah. in the chat. Yep, link's yeah. in the chat and also was in your confirmation email. So thank you, everybody, and have a fantastic night. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.